Hello everybody, Aimer back with another Mission Impossible episode review. This time we are reviewing Season 5, Episode 2, which is called Flipside. So this time we have a cold open again, starting with a fellow named Mel Bracken. He's discussing expanding his drug empire with some other dude. A strung out girl comes into the room and wants to dance, but Mel's henchman Freddy takes her away. He dumps her out of a car out onto the street, where she finds a dance club and starts to groove, but falls to the floor and seemingly dies of an overdose. Jim gets his instructions in a park, out in the open. Sigh. The mission is to expose and destroy the drug distribution ring that consists of Bracken, his Mexican supplier, Diego Maximilian, and U.S. pharmaceutical giant, C.W. Cameron. Jim tells us that Cameron's export to Mexico is totally illegal, so the plan is to connect him to Bracken directly. Barney exits out of the hood of the car, not the trunk, the hood, it's kind of neat, and manages to climb onto one of Cameron's delivery trucks and get inside, placing a pill with a tracking device in one of the bottles, hopping dangerously off the truck when he's done and into a van to follow it. He signals Jim that he's ready, and Willie intercepts a drug buyer named Simpson so that Jim can take his place with Bracken. Maximilian arrives at his favorite restaurant, where Dana is singing as Cindy Dawson, whose mother Lucy once had a fling with Maximilian, and Paris is her guitarist Frankie. Maximilian invites him over to his table, reminding Dana as Cindy that she knew him once as Uncle Max a long time ago. Cameron and his stuffy wife Bunny join them as well. Maximilian gets a call from Bracken, indicating that he wants to double his order, thanks to Jim's big order. Jim sees that Bracken has a recorder going and punches out Freddy to get the tape, showing he means business. Paris talks to Maximilian about getting hooked up with a record deal, and he offers to take the two with him to Los Angeles. After another song, Dana asks Cameron for a dance and asks very flirty and seductive, and says she'd like to see him again in L.A. if possible. And Cameron says he'll call her as his wife interrupts the whatever's going on. Dana tells Paris she's not sure if he'll bite, but she tried her best. Dana and Paris are introduced to Bracken in Los Angeles, who uses his record label to launder his money. And uh, he offers uh, Dana an audition. Barney follows the truck to Maximilian's warehouse and continues as it's loaded onto another truck. And when the driver of that truck stops for a meal, Barney picks a lock to get in. He finds the, their device in boxes that are disguised as peanuts. Barney reports it to Jim as the driver returns, noticing the door is ajar and the lock is open. He brings Barney out at gunpoint, but fortunately Barney is able to knock him out and take the truck back across the border, calling Jim and telling him he has a new plan, meeting up with Willie. Cameron does decide to call Dana after thinking about it, and says he sent his wife up to San Francisco to do some shopping and wants to meet for dinner. After dinner, they head back to his hotel room where she pops some pills to his shock and starts putting the moves on him, then starts up some music and dancing like a dervish, continuing to down the pills. Dana falls and asks for help. Paris arrives and tries to calm her down, but then he tells Cameron she's dead. Cameron is predictably just worried about the potential publicity and fallout from a dead girl being found in his hotel room allowing Paris to guilt trip him and prepare to call the police. But Cameron stops him and offers him some money to get rid of her, which he disgustedly does. Barney delivers a truck to Bracken and tells him that the usual driver is sick, so he had to make the trip, as Jim arrives with Willie for his goods, which turn out to actually be peanuts, causing Bracken to go a little bit bonkers. Freddy demands answers from Barney, but Jim says he wants Willie to handle questioning Barney, so the two of them leave. Jim wants his money back, but Bracken says, I don't have it, Maximilian has it. Freddy figures he can find out he can find out where Maximilian is from Dana. Jim tells Bracken he's got six hours to deliver, or there will be hell to pay. Freddy brings a frightened Paris to Bracken's office, telling him I have nothing to do with her with her dying. I just took the body away on Cameron's orders, tells him the whole story. Freddy gets Cameron to come to the office too, and Bracken tells him that he needs a shipment right away, despite Cameron's objections of the risk of working without a middleman. But Bracken makes it clear he's already in serious trouble because of what happened with Nana. Cameron complies and sends the pills in unmarked boxes and bottles as Jim and Willie come to the warehouse to collect. Barney takes pictures from up in the rafters. 
Freddy spots him and starts shooting, so Willie and Jim are forced to neutralize Bracken and Freddy. As Cameron pleads for them to not do anything that might make him look bad, pretty, 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 pretty please, but Bracken tells him the truth that the IMF had them dead to rights all along, and Cameron is pushed outside into the waiting hands of the police. As he's taken away, he finds himself face to face with a very much alive Dana, who tells him that there was indeed a Cindy Wilson, who died of an overdose last year. Mission accomplished. I'm going to give this episode a grade of a B-. minus. It's right on the border between B minus and C plus, in my opinion. Um, the good. What's good about it is it. it I think uh, the the best thing I can say about it is it's a good showcase for Leslie Warren uh, as Dana, which was much needed uh, to kind of to kind of introduce her properly to the audience. This was going to be the first episode of the season that was shown, but the producers decided to go with the killer instead of this, and this was the second one. Um, so the whole idea was to get Dana featured and say, okay, here's our new female agent. Nothing wrong with that. I think that Leslie Warren pulls off a really good performance in this one. No, not, nothing bad to say about that. Um, the guest stars, um, Sal Minio as Bracken, is so perfect for his role. I think he just oozes the right combination of sleeves on the one hand and intelligence on the other, like street smart intelligence. And I really like that he pulls it off perfectly. Um, Dana Elkar, of course, as, as C.W. Cameron, stodgy, sanctimonious, self-righteous, but not, not too self-righteous. He knows, he knows exactly you know, what his company is doing, how complicit he is. And, you know, it, it, it's like, well, gee, I wish it didn't have to be this way, but boy, I sure do enjoy being rich. So, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like that. And, um, yeah, I, I, I love Dana Alcar. I've always loved him as an actor. Um, you know, it, you know I, like I said, both of them are, are quite good. Robert Alda as Maximilian uh, doesn't get a whole lot of time in this um, episode, but you know he he he's also pretty good as Maximilian. Another thing that I that, that I noticed this time that I didn't quite notice on previous watches of this is it, it, when when Dana dies, quote unquote. Um, Paris, you know, acts so sad about her. Oh my gosh, you know, she was going to get her big break. You know, what, what's so sad that a pretty young girl has died and that sort of thing. And, and you know, he's looking at the camera and we see that his, you know, he's kind of like kind of looking over his shoulder as, he, as he's saying it. Cameron, of course, can't see his face, but we can see, you know, the, the look on his face, which, which speaks volumes, frankly, about how disgusted he is at Cameron's attitude to what's going on around him. All the guy's concerned about is this, you know, his public image. Um I, I noticed that this time, and I thought, boy, that, that's, that, that, that's pretty neat. In terms of the overall, the usual things that I point out about the plot and whatnot, this is a unique plot, so, so, so that's a good thing. I think that's kind of why I would give this one a B- minus rather than a C+. Plus. It's not really a cookie-cutter plot. Um, but there's certainly nothing too flashy here. It's a kind of a very, very matter-of-fact mission, which is fine, but, uh, you know, nothing wrong with that in terms of what the IMF is trying to do. Um, but, again, again th there's not a lot of rewatch value here. Like Once you've seen it and you get the basics of the plot, it's like, okay, I watched it. No, no point really going back and watching it again. There's no real high spots, I wouldn't say. Um, moving on to what's not good, not good about it, I wouldn't say that, again, that there's anything that's really kind of not good, but that's really only because, there is, as I just mentioned, there's really nothing too flashy, so there's nothing really to come down from. It is kind of a flat episode, plot-wise. But I, but I would be completely remiss if I didn't do kind of a point-counterpoint of, you know, what this episode is obviously all about, okay? Um... Starting with kind of the counterpoint, it is that, you know, this is a really delicious episode. Don't kid yourself. You know, obviously the writers were trying to make a socio-political, social point, I guess is probably better to say, um, about 
the fact that drugs are bad. And, you know, at, at this time, this episode was filmed in 1970. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was a big problem. It was a growing problem in America. It still is today, okay? I mean, of course, you know, not a lot has changed, unfortunately, uh, in terms of that. And, uh, and, and in many ways, things have gotten even worse. Um, the, the anvil here of, you know, the whole drugs are bad, okay, um, it, it doesn't make the episode worse, as sometimes such anvilicious episodes just get up all, they get up all up in themselves, just trying to, you know, hammer the point down uh, of, of what the writers are trying to say. In this case, it doesn't make it worse, but it, it, it I don't know, it, it doesn't really add to the plot. It's, it's just, just enmeshed with it, and it is what it is, I guess is probably the best that I would say. The, the, the point, which I would say is good about the way that the writers handled it, is I like the way, and I think that this was probably very, very unique at the time, because, again, I wasn't there before I was even born, but I think at the time, a lot. Uh, it seems to me that most people looked at the drug problem only in terms of, well, there are people out there who are junkies, and they're the real problem, right? Um, rather than looking at it as a supply issue and who is benefiting from having all of these junkies out there. Uh, and and, and I, I really do like the way, now maybe I'm wrong, and maybe people were a little bit kind of savvy to the, to, to the bigger picture, but I really do like the way that the producers really, you know, gave us the big picture in this. That, you know, this is an issue that starts from up at the top. It's really about money, follow the money, right? There are manufacturers, there are high-level distributors, there are people who are making money off of this human suffering. And it's not just, you know, mafia types or, you know, drug lords. It's very, very easy uh, for people to think that, oh, it's just, you know, you know, people in Mexico or other countries or South America or whatever, and they're the ones who are benefiting. No, nah, you know what? It, it, and, and sadly, it's still true today. I did a little bit of research, and I don't know the extent of it, obviously, just a little bit of research, but the whole idea of exporting drugs seems to be something that, uh, you know, probably again, because of some of the things that are discussed in this episode, because of lobbying efforts and, uh, and, and things like that, has pretty much gone untouched. There's still, you know, millions, billions of dollars worth of drugs that are exported from countries like the US and probably Canada as well and other places in the world, you know, to, you know, country, in other countries, and that's perfectly legal. And then, of course, those drugs or the chemicals that are in those drugs come back to these countries where the demand is higher and there's more money to be made. And, you know, that's the issue. Follow the money and you'll understand that the problem is much bigger than just the fact that there is a demand for drugs, by, you know, out there. Uh, and, and I think that the, from, from, the, from the standpoint of just making that point, I think the producers did this pretty well. I would, I would say I haven't seen a lot of TV other than you know, this show from, from that era, but I, 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 I would be interested if people can point me to some other things where other shows of this time you know, looked at and tackled the problem in this way you know, at more of a big picture level. Um, interesting, that, like the conversations that some of the three antagonists have with each other, you know, um, Cameron and Maximilian, when they're talking in the restaurant, talk about, you know, Cameron is all like, oh, man, you don't understand the problems I have. I got, you know, I, I have lobbying expenses and, you know, things like, you know, I have to keep my image clean and, you know, I have all sorts of things that I have to do just so that I can keep your business going. And Maximilian is just like, oh, yeah, you, you got it easy. My gosh, you have to pay taxes. Oh, poor you. I got to worry about the police and being taken to jail, right? Um, and then even l later on, you know, uh, Maximilian and Bracken talk about how Cameron 
you know, has, you know, he just, he's, he's, as I mentioned, he's sanctimonious and self-righteous. He just wants to keep his image and hands clean and, you know, doesn't really care about, you know, what happens to them. And they're just like, yeah, well, what are you going to do? We got to get our stuff from somewhere, that sort of thing. Even today, we're still going through a crisis here in Canada where I am and in the United States, and, 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 and I'm sure in other places in the world. I don't mean to paint this as a, as a problem for a specific area. Um, the opioid crisis is still lingering, um, and drug manufacturers have an ability to benefit from it. Right. And unfortunately, it's a really, really, really tough thing. I, you know, can see that sort of thing on a lot of shows recently on Ozark, which was a, um, a show that maybe at some point I might review as well. Although There are a lot of reviews out there, uh, you know, looked at the problem of how drug manufacturers are in this kind of very kind of, a, a little bit of a perverse um, cycle of, you know, they have to sell drugs obviously those drugs are beneficial to some people but many of those drugs have the ability to be abused and you know these companies that are making a lot of money have ways of you know flying under the radar sometimes um you know giving big donations from their profits to fund, you know, anti-drug programs and rehab programs and things like that. But at the end of the day, they are still part of the cycle. So even from 50 years ago, not much has changed as, as far as that goes. It's an interesting lesson to all of us. So while I applaud the producers for the way that they went about it and the writers for the way that they structured this episode, that part of it is really, really great. This is as an episode for entertainment value, though. I'm going to stick with my grade of B minus, and I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys as always for watching. Uh, please like this review video. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and please leave your comments. Interested to hear what other people have to say about the way the subject matter is treated in this episode. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.